The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. We have now advanced in our study of John's Apocalypse to the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, and it concerns the incorporated Christ. Well, chapter 12 starts with two great wonders in heaven. The first is a woman, and the second is a dragon. And Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 through 2 says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in pain, and pained, or travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. Now the emblem of the sun, moon, and stars reminds us, or it should remind us, of Joseph's vision of his family. Father being the sun, Jacob, mother the moon, and his brothers and he forming the 12 stars. You need to read the dream of Joseph and the interpretation of that dream. And therefore, the woman speaks of Israel. However, the fact that the woman is in heaven, it's not a woman on earth, a woman in heaven, the fact that she's in, heaven, in the heavenlies tells us that this is the faithful remnant of Israel who have accepted Jesus as Messiah. This is the stock of Abraham, the faithful remnant, and the church of Hebrews chapter 12. We may touch on that comment later. Well, Revelation chapter 12, verses 3 through 4 says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns on his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, in order to devour her child as soon as the child was born. Well, without getting into a lot of exegesis on the subject of the red dragon, and we could certainly do that, but we won't do it. Suffice it to recognize that John says in verse 9 of this chapter, quote, and the great red dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So the great red dragon, whatever form or format he may, may take, really it is the devil and it is Satan that is involved in this power. Well, the red dragon, as a symbol of Satan, was manifest in Herod the Great and is waiting to destroy the Christ child after hearing about the coming of the Christ from the wise men. Now, Revelation 12, 5 through 6 says, And she brought forth a man-child, which was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Well, Schofield, you may say, why do you quote Schofield so often? Because I know I'm speaking to a lot of fundamentalists, and Schofield was the fundamentalist fundamentalist, not always right in his comments, and always remember that he left his eschatology and his theory on the second coming to another man. So it was another man whose comments on prophecy are really uh, found in the Schofield Bible. But Schofield himself was an attorney and had some remarkable spiritual insights. Well, I don't think there's very much question as to who the man-child is. The man-child is the Christ, and Schofield so identifies the man-child. The problem is this. If you go along with the suggestion 
of the Spanish Roman Catholic Jesuit Ribera that everything after the third chapter is in the future, then the man-child can't be Christ and he must be in the future. And this has led to some ludicrous, ridiculous, wild doctrines. No, the man-child is the Christ. Now, Revelation 12 and 6 says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand three hundred and threescore days, or a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Well, if Mary is the personification of the woman, and we'll elaborate on that subject a little bit later. If Mary, the Virgin Mary, is the personification of the woman, then the simplest explanation of the scripture I've just read is to understand that this, as Mary and Joseph fleeing with the young child into Egypt. Now, it is generally reckoned by historians that Herod the Great died about two years after Christ was born. And although there is much traditional material about the Holy Family in Egypt, we do not know for certain when Mary and Joseph returned with their child to the Holy Land. Luke, as a matter of fact, doesn't mention the flight at all. Well, Matthew only tells us about it in Matthew chapter 2 and verses 19 through 23. And Matthew says this, But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And Joseph arose and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. And when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea, in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into parts of Galilee. At the heart of everything World Missionary Evangelism does is reaching out and saving the lost through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do this through native missionaries. Right now, we have many native missionaries who need sponsors. That's right, partners just like you, who will help them become full-time workers for Christ. That provides this native missionary with the ability to give his life full-time to gospel outreach. We also need Bibles. That allows us to share the word with those we reach in the mission field. If you would like to either sponsor a native missionary or provide the gift of Bibles, simply call us at segment, we considered how that when the great red dragon appeared in the form of Herod the Great to devour the man-child as soon as he was born, 
Joseph and Mary took the young child Jesus and fled into Egypt. We don't know how long they were there, probably a little over two years. But then the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, the ones who try, were trying to kill the young child are good, go back to the land of Israel. And Joseph went back, but when he heard that Archelaus reigned instead of Herod the Great, the Word of God says he turned aside into parts of Galilee and went and dwelled in a city called Nazareth, and Matthew adds the words that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Well, Archelaus came to power about the same time that Herod died, and he committed some atrocious initial acts. No wonder Joseph turned aside to Nazareth, about as far north as he could get and still be in the Holy Land, because some of the acts of Archelaus who succeeded Herod included the slaughter of 3,000 Pharisees. And so Joseph was rightly concerned about being a resident in the domain of Archelaus. Now, jo Matthew does not tell us of what appears to be a second warning in a dream, but simply that Joseph turned aside into Galilee. How long this took isn't known. Revelation 12, verses 7 through 10 says, And there was war in heaven. Matthew and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So the dragon obviously is presented here as a corporate power. Continuing to read the scripture. And he, that is a dragon, prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven for the dragon. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard, John says, a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. Unquote. Well, it hardly needs to be said that there was a great conflict at Gethsemane, at Gabbatha, or the judgment seat of Pilate, and Golgotha. There was action in the heavenlies, but the action in the heavenlies was reflected in the earthlies. And we also need to remember that Michael is also understood to be a pre-incarnate manifestation of the Christ. And as Michael, the Christ battled in spirit with Satan at this epochal and determining event of history. Satan was defeated by the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Now, I think that many Christians miss the fact that Satan and his angels were ca cast out of the heavenlies into the earthlies. Jesus said, thy kingdom come, pray this way, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Satan is not in heaven somewhere or in the heavenlies. Satan's sphere of action now is in the earth. That's why the earth is getting so torn up. Well, Jesus had said at the time that the 70 disciples returned, from proclaiming the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now here again is an emphasis upon the corporate Christ. This event, the proclaiming of the gospel, demons being cast out, this event involved both Christ and the church, 
And so Revelation 12, verses 11 and 12 says, quote, and they overcame him. Who's they? That's the believers in Christ. Overcame who? Overcame Satan. By the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and loved not their lives unto the death. Now, people often emphasize the physical aspect of the word life there, but the real translation is they love not their soul life or their self life unto the death. Therefore, Rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows he has but a short time. Well, the 13th and 17th verses of Revelation say this, And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman, which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two great wings of an eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place. And by the way, the word place there is a very specific place where she is nourished for a time, times, and a half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast, cast out of his mouth a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away, water as a flood that he might cause her to be a carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And that is how the chapter concludes, and we'll look at those words and make our commentary on them in the next segment of this program, which follows. For so much of the world, in places that world missionary evangelism has missions, water is not there. And when it is, it's not safe. World missionary evangelism for more than 50 years has drilled and dug water wells. And we've done it more than just to supply a community with water. We've done it to save lives. Because the largest killer in most third world countries is fouled or polluted water. World Missionary Evangelism through our water programs has saved thousands of lives through water wells. Not long ago, we drilled a well in Kenya. And a man who watched the water coming out of the ground, an elder in a Maasai community, walked up to our president and said, did your God do this? And essentially, yes, he did. It has changed an entire community. That water well began it, but now there's education through schools. There's children's programs. There are churches. There are so many other things going on thanks to a gift of water. The next time you drink a glass of water from your tap, remember, it's pure gold in many parts of the world. The next time you pour a glass of water out, think that you're pouring out something that someone else would treasure more than anything else. segment, we read the concluding words, the concluding words of chapter 12 of John's Apocalypse. And the big picture is this, that the dragon set out to persecute the woman. And the woman was given the means to flee into the wilderness away from the face of the dragon for a period of time. The dragon cast out a flood like water after her to try and carry her away. The earth helped the woman by swallowing the flood and the dragon then set out to make war 
with the seed of the woman? Well, the first question to ask is what is the identity of this woman? Now, initially, I have said it's the faithful remnant of Israel. You know, today you can get a lot of information on the internet if you have a computer and you're hooked into the internet. So an easy thing to do nowadays is simply to do what I did and type in on your browser, type in the words, Catholic teaching on Revelation 12. And you'll be amazed what you come up with. You don't have to wonder or go to a library and research anymore. The information is right at your hand. So I typed in Catholic teaching on Revelation 12. And the reason I did this was because I wanted to see what the Catholic Church believes today compared with what Ribera said in the 1500s when he said everything after chapter 3 in Revelation is in the future. And I thought, what's the Catholic position today? Well, the Catholic viewpoint is that this woman of Revelation is representative of Eve, as in Adam and Eve, the first woman, representative of Mary, representative of Israel, and representative of the church. She is represented to, representative of Eve as the woman whose seed, Christ, would eventually crush the serpent's head. She is representative of Mary as the mother of Christ. She is representative of the faithful remnant of Israel and she is representative of the church. Now, although it is not in the Bible, there is a tradition that Adam and Eve were separated after the fall and that Eve wandered for an extended period of time after they were expelled from the Garden of Eve until the time when Adam found her. Now, is that in the Bible? No. Is that tradition? Yes. Then again, we have to recognize that Mary, the mother of Jesus, had to flee from the face of Herod the Great when Christ was born. And eventually, she went with John the Beloved to Asia Minor and got away from the face of the serpent represented by the Herod family. Then we must remember that Israel was forced by the Romans to flee from their homeland on pain of death. And the name, by the way, of the Holy Land was changed by the Romans to Syria, Palestina. Then we have to recognize the church also was forced out of the Holy Land by Jewish persecution, backed by, up by the Romans, and very serious circumstances. And then we have to realize that the seed of the woman is the faithful remnant which now, along with other things, has the testimony of Jesus. Well, the flood from the dragon's mouth is a flood of words, and certainly we know that a flood of heresies was cast at the early church. Now, I've spoken previously about Greek philosophy that started in 500 BC, about the same time the Jews were coming out of the Babylonian captivity. And it caused tremendous problems to the state of Israel. And that same Greek philosophy brought heresies into the church. And the church struggled for several hundred years with the heresies. Well, the flood of words might have been very effective, as a matter of fact, if the church had remained in the Holy Land. But when the church fled into the world, uh, they're becoming dispersed and a much more difficult target to attack. And so in that sense, the flood was dissipated into the earth, the earth into which the church fled. 
Well, it's said that the woman was given two great wings so she could flee into the wilderness for a time, times, and the, and the dividing of a time or half a time. This is an expression, a type of numerology that takes us back to the prophet Daniel. And it is particularly used of big events in history, big periods of time in history. Now, time is actually 360 somethings. So a time times and a dividing of a time is 1,260 somethings, but we're not sure what those somethings are. Uh, they may be understood as years, might be understood as days. But a different way of looking at it is this, that the Greek word for time and times is the word kairos, which signifies a fixed or definite period, a season, and an opportune or seasonable time. So in modern terminology, we might understand this as meaning, as three and a half times meaning, as long as it takes, or whatever time is required. But nonetheless, we have the big picture of Revelation chapter 12 without trying to fix times and seasons and all the pitfalls involved in that kind of thing. Nonetheless, in the next program, I will give you Catholic teaching and understanding of the three and a half times. For almost six decades, World Missionary Evangelism has been involved in sharing the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Going to many places where people have never seen a Bible or heard the word, reaching out in other regions where Christians are a small minority, our native missionaries have fearlessly joined the spiritual battle to save souls and transform lives. Each day, people come to know Jesus through this mission, and they're baptized in His name. Those who are baptized become part of a Christian fellowship that impacts communities and brings light to dark regions. Programs like this prove that the evangelism in world missionary evangelism is not just a part of a name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is the heart of our work.